Good evening again, <laughs> Thursday night photo people. I'm Michael David Murphy, Digital Director for Atlanta Celebrates Photography. Welcome to our fourth installment of History Rewound. If you missed a previous week's episode, they're on our YouTube channel at acpinfo.org slash YouTube. Thanks to Fulton County Arts and Culture and special thanks to KEH with whom we conceive this program as a view backward at some of the most celebrated photographers and photographs in the medium. Our organizing principle for this project will be the camera types and formats used by photographers to create some of our favorite images. My intent is to keep these presentations as accessible and sprightly as possible. We hope you'll see something new. Photos streaming past include some of the pictures we've referenced in previous weeks and a few we'll be getting into tonight. Each week, I like to point folks back to the week one introduction, where I talked about the canon of pictures and the established history of photography. Like last Thursday, it's important to remember why the history of this medium lacks diversity of all kinds while consistently asking what you can do, what I can do to widen it and create a more representative future for the medium. Tonight, we've hit upon this real sweet spot of photographic excellence from which we could fashion hours and hours of programming. The opportunity to view photographic history through such a singular viewfinder like tonight has been a challenge. Just like last week, stick with me. We'll end up back here in 25 minutes and uh, I'll be able to field your questions. If they come up along the way, just hit that Q&A button and submit them and we'll talk about them at the end. So tonight we'll be taking a look at what photographers made while using medium format single lens reflex cameras, which are this kind of offspring of the week three TLRs on the left and week two SLRs on the right. Here's a body of a Hasselblad 503 without its lens. This is an actual camera <laughs> currently available on the K newly re redesigned KEH website. Right now, you could take home part of this presentation if you wanted to. Generally, as we'll see in a second in this video, the idea behind medium format SLRs in this kind of modular Hasselblad mode, just like we talked about with the advent of the Nikon SLRs, is that you buy a body, you buy a lens, you get a film back, you're good to go. So let's take a closer look with KEH. This is the single lens reflex is the most popular design for medium format cameras, thanks to its reliability, usability, and versatility. Manufacturers like Hasselblad, Mamiya, and Contax have been making medium format film SLRs for the better part of a century, only stopping production on some models as recently as the 2010s. The concept is similar to 35 millimeter SLRs, a mirror and prism make it possible to look and focus through the same lens that imprints on the film. Medium format SLRs can shoot in a variety of aspect ratios, the most popular being square, 4x3, and 6x7. Medium format film offers increased resolution over 35 millimeter film while still retaining the convenience of being loaded and shot in rolls as opposed to single sheets like in large format photography. The ability to quickly switch preloaded magazines of film from one stock to the next without having to finish the roll made medium format cameras popular tools for fashion and commercial photographers. Additionally, the ability to use a variety of different lenses on medium format SLRs means that they're more versatile than twin lens reflex cameras, as the latter rarely offer the option to switch lenses. The availability of different focal lengths is what led NASA to commission Hasselblad to make dozens of modified medium format SLRs to accompany astronauts of the Apollo program to space. This partnership ended up producing some of the first images of Earth from space, as well as the astronauts' time spent on the moon. Most medium format SLRs come equipped with a waist level viewfinder. Although, being that they're largely modular, eye-level prism finders are also available as an option. On top of the interchangeable lenses, film backs, and viewfinders, 
Most medium format SLRs also allow the photographer to change out screens, grips, winders, and more, making for a truly customizable system. With the recent resurgence of film photography, the medium format SLR has remained a popular choice for photographers who value image quality and versatility above all. Excellent, thanks KEH. Uh, tonight, as we dive into these medium format SLRs as best expressed by the Hasselblad in the center and these two variations, one in the hands of Malik Sidibe on the left, and on your right as this kind of otherworldly Franken camera designed and deployed by NASA in the Apollo missions to the moon. This was the plan uh, to cram all of this into a tight 20, <laughs> and, but I wanted to focus more in depth on the edges. So the center kind of fell away. Tonight we'll be overlooking two classic formidable American photographers who are exemplars of this format, Robert Maplethorpe, Rosalind Solomon, just two quick nods before we get into West Africa and the universe. So in order to concentrate on photographers and photographs from West Africa, as well as these pictures from outer space, I'm not sure where the line of outer space begins. This is this kind of gift of being able to look at history from the perspective of formats versus chronologically or by location or alphabetical order even. Malik Sidibe was a studio photographer in Mali in West Africa. He started as an apprentice in the studio and worked his way up. He was known for his photographs of young people and nightlife uh, in Mali shortly after they won independence from France in June of 1960. Here's a few of the cameras from his studio. While we can see nearly every flavor of the cameras we've already dis discussed on Thursday nights, you'll notice a Hasselblad over there on the left on the edge, in addition to a bunch of TLRs, SLRs, range finders, Polaroids even. And while there are photographs of Sidibe using these cameras with his one good eye in the context of a studio setup, I want to take a minute to look at what was on the other side of his lens. Namely, formal portraits of young Malians in their Saturday night best. Most importantly, these pictures were taken of Africans by African photographer, which 50 or more years earlier hadn't been the case when European photographers ventured to Africa only to photograph the most primitive or to make the kinds of photographs that cemented colonialism's goals of command, conquer, and plunder. And yet these views from Malik Sidibe's studio were as personal and localized as they were potentially and demonstrably global. It's easy to come across characters and scenes you might even recognize. Yes, the fashions changed, but it's the universality of the faces in Sidibe's photographs that have the ability to communicate across decades. It's this young man's pose, his confidence, the pride in revealing oneself, not necessarily as who you are, but who you want to be. And it's Sidibe's talent as a photographer to merge the desire of revealing people as they like to be revealed with whatever glimpse or expression he sees through the lens that might contain a deeper revelation about personality, family, about the psychology of who might be in front of his camera. It's this emotional sensitivity that drives the strength of his photographs, showing families at their most family-esque, like here with this toddler on the gas tank, the entire motorbike inside the studio, it's Sidibe's party pictures of young people celebrating new lives of freedom and self-determination in the wake of independence that really spark. This photo is like an idea of what a party looks like when your country metaphorically hasn't been allowed to party for your entire life. And then the music cranks up, everyone's dressed in their best, it might be 1960, but it feels like the 1999 Prince kept talking about, which ultimately leads to this in 1963, which for me 
I'll show my cards. It's, it's gradually become one of my favorite photographs in the history of the entire medium. The elements are all here. The candid stylishness of the subjects, the thrill of how it must feel to dance barefoot after curfew in a nice dress. I, I don't know the thrill. I, I imagine it's pretty great. The universality of the gesture, the restraint of their arms and hands, the bashful expression on the young woman's face, their heads touch or are nearly touching. You can almost hear the empty bottles in the background clinking on the cement, the texture of the courtyard's floor and the trees behind, the twinning of their feet reflecting each other's step, the unfolding of the two of them at the center of the scene as if a butterfly or Rorschach test infused with all the potential of young love. This photograph is everything to me. Even if you're ambivalent or less impressed with this particular frame, isn't this picture what we as photographers or as creative image seekers ultimately want from our own work? To be able to make an impact on people you've never known and will never meet? Malik Sidibe, who passed in 2016, offered up this photograph in an envelope addressed to the future, where it happened to land here again tonight, on my screen, on yours, in this shared middle ground of a global pandemic, when people are urged apart from each other, when moments like this are increasingly rare. Shot with flash, this photograph may have been made with one, any one of the TLRs from C to Bay's shelf. I like to think of him in that courtyard with his eye as the true thing that matters, not necessarily the make and model of his collection device. Well, we could keep looking at more frames of Sidibe's work. Let's take a peek at Sedu Kita. He preceded Sidibe, making work earlier in the late 40s and 50s, most of it in large format, which We'll be talking about it more in depth next week, but I wanted to offer it here tonight to substantialize our view of Sidibe's work and see how both of their images continue to influence image makers. Again, we're seeing a studio set up much like Sidibe's, but with textured wallpaper, props available for sitters like this radio and clock. Here's a different radio, a bit more distressed. The exact same backdrop contrasted with the woman's perfect polka dot dress and her uh, sparkling jewelry. Here's a floral backdrop with a young man in flower. Again, top notch styling with the glasses and tie and even a felt tip pen in his jacket pocket. And while these three examples are definitely large format, they show the extension of styles and references Sidibe had to draw from, a, a fellow photographer in Mali. Both of their work has often been presented side by side in exhibition, especially in the late 90s, early 2000s, when they were discovered by Western collectors, curators, and museums decades after making these pictures. You can see Seydou Kita's influence here in, of all places, this clip from Janet Jackson's Got Till It's Gone video featuring Q-Tip and Joni Mitchell. There are direct references here to both Kita and Sidibe's work, the backdrops, posing with a flower, the parties, the dancing. I'm not sure about the, the woman standing under the water. That, <laughs> that just looks pure 90s to me. And in photographs like this, again, Kita as a local photographer professionally capturing the regalness and beauty of his own community. We see antecedents for artists like photographer, painter, sculptor, Micheline Thomas, who was here in Atlanta for Art Papers Live at Spelman in 2017, and a show at the Georgia Museum in Athens during ACP Fest later that year. And we see similar references in both fashion and style through the paintings of contemporary artist Ken De Wiley, who again leans on established conventions of portraiture from both the history of painting and from Kita and Sidibe in photography to visually depict contemporary African-Americans with a style and flair 
as original as it is reverential to past masters. In fact, the, the reverence and references keep cycling through. Seen here again, a Sidibe Kita uh, studio style quotation found in the work of contemporary artist Samuel Faso, a photographer from Cameroon, who, which is the east side of West Africa or the west side of Central Africa, who in, this, in the wake of Cindy Sherman's early efforts, stages self-portraits here within the context of another artist's body of work. And occasionally the result is crafty enough to resemble the pattern fabrics found in Quito while appearing on a website featuring the photographs of Sidibe. And who was it that had the radios in their photos? Was it Janet or Joni? Now for something different, possibly related. I can't promise. This is the ATS-3 geostationary satellite, which took a picture on November 10th, 1967, which was the first photograph ever made of the entire Earth. That photograph, which may have been in part a mosaic, depending on what sources you consult, landed as the first cover image in 1968 on an only in California idea, which was to have a catalog of all the things you need to live when you want to live a life beyond the one chosen for you by your family or corporations or this kind of growing wave of suburbanism. And in his famous graduation address at Stanford in 2005, Steve Jobs referred to the Whole Earth Catalog as quote, Google in paperback form, idealistic and overflowing with neat tools and great notions, unquote. It was kind of like the internet before the internet became this commodified, corporatized, monopolized space. And by using this satellite's image as their first cover, the Whole Earth Catalog played a part in jumpstarting the modern environmental movement, a push from young people that eventually led to the development of the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970, the first Earth Day in April of that year, and regulations like the Clean Water Act in 1972. But between this satellite picture, the cover of the Whole Earth Catalog, and an awakening, awakening populace intent on not living in a kind of Manhattan that looked like this photo from Chester Higgins, staff photographer at the New York Times in 1973, the Apollo and earlier Gemini missions were sent into space carrying modified Hasselblads. They were especially made for the journey. This is in the midst of these, the whole Earth catalogs. The astronauts like Walter Schirra here, who flew on Apollo 7, uh, they were the first uh, to successfully carry a crew into space in 68. And a few months later, on Christmas Eve, Apollo 8, astronaut William Anders took this photograph with one of the NASA, NASA Hasselblads of Earth rising above the horizon of the moon. And this singular view, which had never been photographed by anyone ever before, except for <laughs> another unmanned American spacecraft, the first to orbit the moon, which had taken this picture in black and white two years prior. So when the moment arrived for Earthrise, the astronauts were amazed. And I'm gonna play a short audio clip. It should come right through. And if it doesn't, just wait 20 seconds, we'll get back to it. it here's what they sounded like when they saw this out the window. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, that pretty. Hey, don't take that, it's not scheduled. You got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color. Quick, oh man, that's crazy. Crazy. I mean, their conversations don't sound any different than people in a station wagon driving by Niagara Falls. Hey, where's the camera? Break it out. Oh my gosh, this is great. We're not stopping for anything. You got to keep moving. <laughs> Anyways, that Earthrise picture taken at F11 at 250th of a second 
flowed back to California, where it kept appearing in the publication that was the internet for its time, which Steve Jobs kept reading, which inspired the Greta Thunbergs of their day to think about Earth as its own kind of space vehicle that needs to be cared for like any other closed system seeking to avoid catastrophe. Seven months later, Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin landed on the moon. And here's the photograph of that one small step, or the giant leap. But this picture is actually neither. So I'm not saying the moon landing's fake. I know we're on YouTube, but I'm just pointing out that that is not Neil Armstrong, because any photograph made on the surface of the moon of an astronaut descending the ladder has to be taken by a photographer who's already standing on the surface of the moon, which is, of course, Neil Armstrong. That's Buzz Aldrin coming down the steps. The NASA Hasselblad, NASA Hasselblad, <laughs> that he used, uh, was attached to his chest, and there wasn't really a viewfinder. It was a medium format kind of point and shoot. Uh, on the right, this is the film magazine. It carried a large roll of film. I think they could get 70 shots on a single magazine. And again, one of the easiest ways of knowing that this isn't a photograph of the first man on the moon, it's a Buzz Aldrin, the second man, is that the first man had to be the photographer. But then again, you can just zoom into these incredible scans that NASA made publicly available in 2005. And you can see his nameplate vertical on his chest right about here. I'll try to move my pointer around right there, Aldrin. And if you peer deep into the pixels, you can also see Armstrong in the reflection of Aldrin's visor holding the camera just above his waistline. Remarkable. While carrying these cameras to the surface of the moon and coming back with photographs that inspired people to change the world, while thinking about life on Earth a bit differently than before Apollo 11 was definitely a huge achievement for Hasselblad and a ringing endorsement of the engineering and durability of their cameras. It might sting a bit to learn that when they left the surface, shown here with the flag that flag needed like a horizontal bar, a helper to keep it waving because the lunar atmosphere is windless. They left the cameras behind. Only one returned to Earth. It was recently sold at auction. So right now, as you look up in tonight or tomorrow night sky, in mental preparation for whatever NASA is planning to tell us on Monday at noon, about what they found. <laughs> there are 12 custom-made Hasselblads sitting up there, both body and lenses. No film magazines, those, that's what the astronauts brought back. Maybe the telescope on this Boeing plane has figured out a way to bring back the Hasselblads and that's what they're gonna tell us on Monday. <laughs> Perhaps that's what we'll find out, we'll see. Stay tuned. Last year on the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, Hasselblad released a celebratory edition with a digital back, of course, and this great little nod uh, that says, on the moon since 1969, which is totally factual. Well, Earthrise occurred on Apollo 8, and the photographs from the surface of the moon began on Apollo 11. There were even more extraordinary views in subsequent missions. Here's Earth, let's say, half asleep from Apollo 13, uh, a kind of Earth rise as a crescent on Apollo 15. And here's North America from Apollo 16. You can see Mexico and Baja there. Again, these images are yours and mine, available in the public domain. Just do a search for Apollo Archive. You can see all of the frames from all of the magazines, and they've even published large, downloadable, unprocessed scans in case you want to practice your Lightroom skills. Or there's this small photo book from T. Adler Books in Santa Barbara. They published a really tight edit of the photographs in 2016 that inspired me to take a deeper look. Apologies for our clock. And I, this frame 
was definitely an inspiration to look a bit deeper. This came from Apollo 16, where the command module is looking back at the lunar module. And as it's kind of popping up just over the moon's horizon, just on the left side of Earth there. And then with Apollo 17, the whole Earth again. This time, not a catalog's cover, but in camera, on film, taken by an American astronaut with a Hasselblad, unstitched, unmosaiced, the full view, all daylight in December of 1972. Looking down here on Madagascar, the coast of East Africa. But if the astronauts had a super zoom, they could have looked and seen over here these scattered clouds hovering above Mali, where Malik Sidibe was still welcoming clients into his photo studio, making perhaps this photo from the same year, 1972. Uh, I guess there's a one in 12 chance of it being December. Or maybe this one. Does it increase our chances to one to six that this was made the same month as those clouds seen in Apollo 18's view of the whole Earth? What could be better than that? These three men with their radio, posing for a photographer with one good eye, in a photo studio in Bamako, Mali, the corner of 508 and 521, just up the Niger River from Segu, Mopti, and even further, Timbuktu.